The third programming structure that we'll consider is that of a loop, often called an iteration or a repetition structure. So the basic format of a loop is that there's some question that you're asking about, and it's often a Boolean expression that will evaluate the true or false. And whether it's true, we'll continue to execute the loop, and then as soon as the Boolean condition becomes false, we'll exit the loop. There's also a repeat until, which is the opposite. So we repeat and, and until something becomes true and then exit. So it's all based upon some Boolean expression and, and whether or not that evaluates a certain way, we continue to execute the code that is inside of the loop body. So there's three kinds of loops that um, we'll be studying with SNAP. The forever loop is a type of infinite loop, so a loop that continually executes forever. The repeat until is a loop that continues to execute until a certain condition occurs. And then the repeat loop is what we call a counting loop, or in some languages a for loop. So it's a loop that repeats a specific number of times. So the forever loop is an example of an infinite loop. Often, in some cases, an infinite loop suggests that there's a bug or a problem with your program. But sometimes it's frequently the case where you actually want that to happen. So you want a certain process within your program to continually go on forever. A really good example, just a simple one here on the screen, is, would be that of a pacemaker. Obviously, if you have software that's driving a pacemaker, you want your heart to continue to beat. So a forever loop in that case would make a lot of sense. But if you're expecting the loop to end, a forever loop or an infinite loop might actually be a source of a bug. So you'd have to try to figure out why the loop is not ending. So that's, you know, it just depends on the context on whether a forever loop uh, or an infinite loop would be useful. A repeat until loop, again, has a Boolean condition. So something that evaluates to true or false. It can be a Boolean expression that is as complex as it needs to be with multiple logical and relational operators. It just needs to eventually evaluate to a true or false expression. So as you can see here, we have a portion of code that's going to do a countdown from 10 to 1, and then at the blast off time, it'll play a short sound. So what I'm doing in this case is I'm setting a counter, in this case called blast off. So this is a, a variable that I created and I'm using that inside of the loop. I'm initializing it to 10, and the inside, the body of the loop will continue to execute until the blast off variable becomes less than one. So what will happen then is I'm going to just say the value of blast off. So in the scratch output screen, we'll count from 10, 9, 8, all the way down to one, and then whenever blast off becomes zero, that is less than one, that loop or that Boolean expression associated with the repeat until loop will fail or become false and then we'll exit out of the repeat until and we'll play that final sound there, that note at the bottom of the screen. So we'll count from 10 down to 1 and then we'll exit whenever we become 0. So if you notice inside of the loop body there's a change block and it's reducing blast off by 1 each time the loop executes. So we start at 10, we then say blast off, and then we're reducing blast off by one. So this is the same thing as saying blast off equals blast off minus one. We're just decrementing or reducing blast off by one each time. Now a repeat loop is used when we know for sure that the loop is going to execute a certain number of times. So if I know in this last case that blast off will execute 10 times, I can use that in a, to an advantage and make the loop a little bit more simpler because I don't have to have that Boolean expression check there. So a rewrite of the blast off program is right here where you can see that we're again initializing blast off to 10 and now what I'm doing is I'm repeating 10 times. So blast off is 10 so the repeat blast off is really just saying repeat 10 times. And the code there is very similar inside. I mean, it's exact, exactly the same code as before. I am saying blast off, and then I'm reducing blast off. I don't have to do a check, though, like in the repeat until. I just put repeat blast off. And in this case, I then play the note again once I've executed that repeat statement 10 times. You may recall from lesson two, when we did our first look at Snap Live, we drew a square using eight blocks or actually 10 blocks, but eight were drawing the actual square. So on the far left here, or the bottom left of this slide, you can see the code that we wrote from there, from that particular last lesson. So we are moving 50 pixels, and then we're turning 90 degrees, and we're doing that four times. So a total of eight blocks, a move, and then a turn, 
and then four times, that's a total of eight blocks, two blocks per each of the four sides of the square. So what if I wanted to draw a, an eight-sided figure, an octagon, or what if I wanted a 100-sided figure? That would be a lot of blocks using this approach. So a 100-sided figure, I would have to drag over 200 blocks there. You know, 100 blocks to do a move and 100 blocks to do the turn at a certain angle. So that'd be a lot of blocks and becomes kind of tedious to add. So using a, a repeat loop, I can actually make this much more concise and simpler. So in this case, I know I'm looping four times. There's four sides in a square. So I just place inside of the repeat loop a move of the 50 pixels and the actual turning of the 90 degrees. So in this case, I took the essence of drawing a side, it is moving 50 pixels and turning uh, 90 degrees, and I placed that inside of the repeat loop to execute four times. So this is much more simpler, and we can also create shapes that are easier to change than four-sided figures using the other approach. So this actually will drive some of the discussion coming up in our very next lesson. In the next lesson, we'll look at how to build our own blocks. So we will build our own block. Eventually, we'll call this draw shape. And we'll create a block that can take an arbitrary number of sides and an arbitrary length of those sides so we can draw a shape of any kind compared to what we just saw now. It's just a, a square with just 50 pixels. So this will practice the idea of procedural abstraction and this will allow us to learn more about how we write our own blocks and how to write reusable software. So we want to make sure that our software can be reused in other contexts. So that will be the focus of our next lesson.